Let's begin, shall we? Welcome uh, to the NYU Game Center uh, guest lecture series. Uh, tonight we're going to hear from uh, Harvey Smith. And um, before we get started, uh, I just want to um, to uh, make a, a couple little announcements. As always, I want to thank um, our sponsors who help make the lecture series possible: um, Arcadium, Smashworks, and Fresh Planet. Remember, you can remember that you think of a dark arcade and you're playing an arcade game. Then you hulk out and you start to smash it, and then you crush the walls, revealing these beautiful green rolling hills. We have the fresh planet, so um, that's how you remember the sponsors. <laughs> Want everyone to have that image in their head. Um, the um, uh, if you like video games and you like NYU Game Center and you like and you live in New York and you're a person, you also might want to come to the opening of No Quarter tomorrow. Um, so No Quarter is our yearly game exhibit uh, in which Charles Pratt uh, curates a, a selection of uh, games uh, from uh, indie developers uh, that we commission uh, where they create games for a gallery setting, for a public space, for a social setting. And uh, that's tomorrow here on the ninth floor. Uh, that begins around seven and it's just gonna kind of go and it's sort of like an opening, so it'll be a nice party a lot of beer, so please come and help us drink it and play these amazing games. Um, okay, so tonight I'm very excited uh, to have my friend Harvey Smith uh, speak with us. Um, Harvey's a game designer who's been working for 20 years uh, in the industry, um, working on games like, uh, like the Ultima series, uh, System Shock, uh, Fire Team, Deus Ex. Uh, he uh, made an iPhone game called Karma Star, and um, he's uh, currently the co-creative director of Arcane Studios, uh, where he was uh, one of the, uh, the co-leads on uh, the game Dishonored, uh, which is a magnificent game, um, which is universally praised and beloved, and uh, just won the uh, British Association of Film and Television uh, uh, Award for Game of the Year of 2012. Um, so he's going to be talking about that. He's also uh, a, uh, an author. He just released his uh, first novel, uh, which is called Big Jack is Dead. Is that right? And um, so uh, we're very excited to have him. Please help me welcome Harvey Smith. All right. So uh, first of all, can everybody hear me? Is this okay? Um, Thanks for having me. I know uh, you guys have incredibly busy lives, and so I appreciate you giving me your time. I love speaking to students. <coughs> as cool as it is to be a commercial game developer, uh, I look around at my friends in Austin specifically who are on the indie scene, and they have a great deal of freedom with what they do. What uh, the energy and the freedom that students have uh, at programs like this is, uh, is super enviable. Uh, so it's always fun to come and talk to groups like this. The problem is, I'm never sure how useful it is uh, because this talk is one that Rafael Colantonio and I put together. Um, and it is after our experience working on Dishonored for several years. <coughs> Raf was a co-creative director of Dishonored as well and, and the founder of Arcane Studios. He, he's not here. You're going to hear me say Raf and I a lot or me and Raf and that's who I'm talking about. Um, and the, the reason I say it's, I'm not, it's never true clear on how useful it is, is like the material I'm talking about tonight is sometimes very high level, sometimes it's an overview, sometimes it's very subjective, um, sometimes it's very focused on things that, that we find interesting, level design or environmental storytelling, a very particular kind of game. How portable is it to what you're doing? How abstract is it? You know, uh, I don't know. So um, I, I hope it's useful to you. Uh, I'm as excited about the Q&A part and talking to Frank and all of you afterwards as I am about giving you the talk. Uh, I'm going to go a little slower than, uh, than I did at, at, at GDC when Raf and I gave this uh, talk before. We're very concerned for time and all that, uh, but, it's, but it's not an incredibly long talk, so don't worry. Um, so we call it uh, Empowering the Player in a Story-Rich Environment. <coughs> and I think it's important to contextualize this. Um, you know, we make and are attracted to a very specific type of game. Uh, we really like first-person action games. And 
uh, we, we, we like these sort of immersive games that uh, aren't just like you're moving through a valley with walls that you can't get out of and you have a very simple tool which is like point and click and kill enemies or whatever. <coughs> we, like, we like games that give you a wide variety of tools and a wide variety of pathways and allow you to sort of mix them and make choices, uh, play creatively as we say, and we'll, I'll get into that. But to contextualize this talk, um, you you know a lot of that will be coming from this perspective. Having worked on games like Deus Ex or Dishonored, and Raph worked on Arx Fatalis and Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. Some of the guys that I worked with at Arcane uh, tonight, I'm not just representing me and Raph. I'm representing a lot of their work, all the artwork, and and some of their concepts. Some of them worked on Bioshock Two and other games. Some of them worked on Deus Ex with me. Um, I've been at Arcane five years now. And it's very much a company dedicated to this type of game. Um, so to contextualize the speech, that's the kind of thing we do. You'll see if you if you haven't played Dishonored. Uh, it's a sort of steampunk pseudo Victorian game. And I'm gonna I'm gonna move on now. So <clears throat> this was the very first time that I co-created uh, or co-directed something with someone. You know, traditionally, I would have said, like, never put two people in charge of one thing because they'll kill each other. <coughs> Clear lines of, of ownership creatively are very important, right? <coughs> but in this case, Raph and I decided to work side by side and kind of, like, try to co-direct the team. And I have to tell you, it was incredibly challenging at times. But we also learned a tremendous amount. We both looked back on it later, and we were just like, uh, the way I leveled up, you know, and the, and the way he leveled up, it was it was a really amazing experience. And we feel like in some ways, if you get into that kind of role, you have to have a really good relationship with the other person. It just it just doesn't. It's not a. You can't just take two people and do it right. We we've been friends for a long time, and uh, the way we function together in arguments and and in excited moments and and our values overlap eighty five percent of the time. Those things. Um, those things facilitated that. It made it made it possible. And we, the way we see it is, it combined our strengths and reduced reduced our weaknesses. Like when one of us would have gone off a cliff on an idea, the other one kind of checked it, you know. <coughs> and so, Dishonored was definitely a labor of love for us. Uh, we both got into games in professionally, I guess, in '93, and we were both drawn into games. We we don't just like any type of game. You couldn't say, "Hey, would you want to? Here, I'll pay you to make a racing game or whatever." I don't care. Right, like we both got into games because of games like Ultima Underworld or Dungeon Master, uh, these games that like put you in a location from first person, and they craft a cohesive environment that you feel like you can explore. You feel like people live there. You feel like the monsters might have been doing something before, uh, before you got there. They have it's a simulation in a sense that they have a life and a purpose and meaning beyond you, the player. Right, and there's something ma magical about that. It, whether whether you're talking about the Ultima games or um, any any other modern simulation, you know, e even a game with mul uh, multi people and multiple people in one environment, right? Uh, there's something powerful about the fact that the world doesn't revolve around you. <coughs> and so this is a subgenre that we really love, and <coughs> it's a bit of a branching story game plus simulation that somehow allows the player to. Uh, in improvise. I'll, I'll use the word improvisation a lot. Where like, um, what was it the other day? There was a great video that went out on stealth games. Uh, Extra credit to the video on stealth games. And one point I really loved in the middle of it uh, that articulates this actually better than than we did in our talk. I think is that there's two kinds of puzzle games. There's the ones for which there's one solution, and they show a picture of a a, a puzzle with a particular shape that slots in. And there's one for which there are many solutions, and they show more Lego blocks, right, that could be combined in, a, in the pattern to fill the, uh, fill the puzzle piece. And that's, that's what we love. We love giving the player a bunch of tools and a bunch of situations, running things as a, as a bit of a physics and AI simulation, and then letting you solve the problems the way, the way you uh, want. And you can come up with solutions we didn't even intend, right? So this is an ongoing creative pursuit. We have by no means have we perfected this or anything. It's just, it's what's fascinated both of us for <coughs> over 20 years now and 20 years professionally. And so Dishonored ends up being <coughs> a blend of rules-based simulation, a lot of scripting, some randomization of the targets and goals in the, in the world, 
<clears throat> I'm gonna apologize now for my throat. I got up this morning at five in France, and I walked. <laughs> I walked through this dark, sleepy city of Lyon, cobblestone streets, no one out except street cleaners. And I rode the metro to get to the tram, and I rode the tram to the airport, and I flew to Heathrow, and then I flew from Heathrow to JFK. It is like one in the morning for me right now, and so uh, bear with me uh, because my throat is acting up. Uh, but anyway, it's this blend of those things, and a, a very important part is non nonlinear mission environments. And so there are two big sections of the talk coming, and one of them is entirely dedicated to that, uh, but also choke points, to be honest, and a branching storyline again. So we're not pure. We're not like an open-ended simulation made of rules that is running like the game of life that you, the player, inject yourself into. But we're also not like a turn the page to the next, uh, you know, uh, choose your own uh, adventure type book or whatever. We're some weird combination of the two. We love games like that. Um, we found we feel like we find players who have similar uh, tastes and 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 who respond to that sort of thing too. And we do all these things, this combination, in the service of enabling player improvisation in a story-rich environment. That is, we try to create a cohesive, interesting place, in this case, the city of Dunwall, uh, which has its own calendar, its own religion, its own political figures, and uh, its own art style, and you know all, the, all that. It's a, a look and feel, it's a world. Um, but we also don't want you just following a trail of breadcrumbs that we as designer le designers left behind. We want you to be able to look at a situation, formulate a plan, and put together a solution again that we didn't even think of. I'll cover some of those. And this involves balancing player creativity versus narrative constraint. Those two forces that often seem at odds with one another, and very seldomly do people put them together in a very er uh, elegant fashion. Um, uh, you know, and so sometimes it works for us and sometimes it doesn't. As we play Dishonored, you probably saw that. And so what do we mean by uh, balancing player creativity versus narrative constraint? How do we do that? Um, we like to think that we guide and attract the player instead of dictating a path. Many games are, there is a very linear path, there's a set of tools, it's key locked, there's one way to open the door. Uh, we try not to do that. We, we give you a, uh, a number of pathways and you, and you can follow the one you want. We try to enable uh, what people refer to as pull-based narrative. <coughs> that is, instead of uh, pushing information on you in the form of cutscenes or uh, mandatory conversations, as much as possible, we try to layer the environment with uh, information that you can go after if you want. You can pull it to you instead of us pushing it to you. Uh, we try constantly to find ways to give the player freedom, even though we're telling a story. Uh, the player has some direction <laughs> and, a, and a rough plan, and uh, we, we try to avoid player drunk walking, right? Uh, because this is one of the things that happens. The more you try to, to make an open-ended environment where the player is in control, the player has agency, uh, if it's not very clear what, what the player's goals should be, as you'll find in a formal game, uh, then you can end up with the player wandering around going, what am I supposed to be doing again? I, I don't get this. Uh, and I'll cover that in the sort of downside slide as well. Uh, and, we, and we really try to make games that operate at a player-driven pace, right? Uh, whereas most people are like, uh, in, action, in action games, I think very often people are uh, driving the pace forward because they're terrifi terrified of boring the player at all. Uh, we very much like, uh, like a lot of stealth games, we very much like it when the player can stop, wait for a while, eavesdrop, uh, choose the pace at which they play. <coughs> All of these things are ways in which uh, we're constantly going back and forth between enabling the player to, to have input to the game versus constraining the player with some uh, narrative. Another way to look at that is uh, diagram one, as simple as this is, is imagine it as open simulation space. Go where you want, do what you want. Uh, unbounded, um, except at the far edges. Uh, diagram two is a it obviously a linear line where you follow point to point. And what we're trying to do is we are following some kind of narrative structure, <coughs> but within that we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of uh, breadth for the player. The player can move around. And so uh, 
in the case of Dishonored specifically, we allowed for multiple play styles. Uh, you know, you could play very combat heavy, you could sneak, uh, you could use a, a, a variety of powers, you could use these powers or those powers. Um, we facilitated optional goals all through the, through the game. So not only side missions that were elective content or not, but uh, for everything in the game, we provided alternate uh, outcomes. We, we started talking early on in the, the press promotion of the game about this, the fact that this was a game about an assassin where you didn't have to kill anybody. And at first, we got the usual skeptics. Uh, but, but this was just one area in which we said, like, hey, for every outcome, let's, let's provide alternates. Uh, in case something occurs to the player, uh, we, we support it. And also, uh, if the player is going in one particular moral direction or stylistic direction, uh, you know, we're not railroading you, right? They're, they're, they're alternates. <coughs> we also do the thing where we overload the environment with info. Again, back to the pull-based narrative thing and environmental storytelling. Uh, our art team and our level designers work together. The, uh, the things that make up a room, that populate the room, the things left behind, uh, often tell a story and the player can infer. Right, so the player is much more involved, we think, when uh, this inference is happening, when you're looking at an environment and you're concluding things. Uh, again, we, we definitely uh, wanted to do the uh, multiple expressions of morality thing. We didn't want to make a game that said, in order to advance this game, you must kill. Killing is good, you know? Um, we wanted to, to, to enable power fantasy, right? If you wanted to be violent, if you wanted to uh, see wickedness in the world and, and, and uh, exert violence as a way of getting rid of it. That's, that's a track in the, in the game, but you can also play the game and in fact end up with the world in a better state <coughs> if you uh, eschew violence. Um, we, an, another important point here is that we, we reward players for how they get somewhere, not for how they got there, right? So like let's say there's something inside of a room we don't say, way to go, you picked the lock, or way to go, you went through the window. <coughs> we don't care how you get there, right? So if you come up with a way to get there that we didn't even know about, we're okay with it. You, 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 get, you got to the goal, and that's, what, that's how you get rewarded, not for how you did it. And that's an important point, I think, in all of, all of these games, because <coughs> once players know that that's on the table, that um, they're supposed to be finding their own pathway, that they, they're supposed to be figuring their own thing out, um, immediately they sense that there's this possibility in, in the game space. And the last two things uh, related to that we do related to balancing player creativity uh, versus narrative constraint are the bulk of the talk. We, we <coughs> try to make general purpose systems when we make game systems, and we build nonlinear uh, environmental spaces. And we, that section of the talk is referred to as the play path matrix. Okay, so that was an overview, um, and then I'm going to go into the general purpose systems part of the talk and the play path matrix, and then summarize, and then we'll go to Q and A, I guess. So, um, what we what we mean by general purpose systems, <coughs> we like to put things into the game that influence each other through an input-output system. So instead of hard coding a bunch of stuff specifically, the very simplest example that we can give is imagine there is um, a player who is trying to get through a locked door and she doesn't have the key as she's trying, like a guard comes up behind her uh, and a, a fight begins. And Dishonored, there's a first-person melee combat system, all sorts of ranged weapons, things like that. And imagine the guard throws a grenade at the player, it misses the player, lands near the door, and when it goes up, it blows the door up and opens the door, right? This is a very simple example, but you probably know how many games in which this wouldn't be possible, right? Because like <coughs> the door is meant to open with this key that you get by having this conversation or going to this place. Um, what we like to do is let's set up a bit of a simulation and if the door gets opened randomly by the player figuring out some clever strategy or by something happening in the, in the context of play, 
because we're thrilled with that, right? So it's a very simple example uh, about how the entities in our world, the door and the grenade, influence each other through a general purpose input-output system that I'll talk about in a minute. Another way of saying, that, uh, of saying this is that our game mechanics try to listen to one another instead of being, this is a grenade, it literally in one function, it damages enemies. Um, instead what it does is it broadcasts uh, damage and many things in the world are by default set up to listen to this. And therefore we don't have to think about every potential interaction in advance. We don't have to plan everything. <coughs> So the next slide is a very simple representation of the way we try to think about game mechanics. But I have to say, something that Raph and I often talk about is that this is not just a technical implementation detail. It's also a value for the studio. It's a, it's a way of thinking. And we have two examples here, um, two different ways one thing could be implemented. When we first talked about summon wrath, like if you've played the game, you know that the player can, there's a power where you can choose like, to summon a, a, a big swarm of wrath, right? It would be easier as a programmer, as a game developer, uh, as a producer, if you're looking at your little pie chart of, of resources for that part of the game, it would be easier to do the thing, and in fact, someone pitched it initially, where I target an enemy, and you know the rats are attached to invisible bones on that enemy, they're particles or whatever, and they appear there and they devour the enemy. You could assume then that that guy's on the nav mesh. You could assume that the rats aren't going to be in any weird place. They're not going to do anything strange. Uh, you could make them look really good because you could attach them to the body in, in very meaningful ways that you've seen in films and such. And this is one way you could implement the feature and in fact it's the easier way to implement the feature. But it very much goes against our value uh, because it's not a very general purpose system. What we prefer to do instead is target a place in the world, on the ground or whatever, and just spawn a bunch of rats. And then there's some code that says at any given point you guys follow a leader, pick a leader randomly. If that leader gets killed, pick another leader. But behave according to these rules. If there are enemies nearby, attack the enemies. But if there are corpses nearby, you prefer corpses because they don't fight back. Go eat the corpses. If there's light, avoid the light, right? So we just set some rules up and make this very general purpose thing. And that is the way we implemented the summon wrath power in the game. And it's, it's a really good example because, the f like I said, somebody pitched the first version initially and then we deviated and said, no, our principles are more. And the, the value of that, like there are slides later on the value of that, but like if you just think about how much more flexible it is and how much more when you play our game, Things can happen that you made happen that we didn't plan necessarily. Uh, whereas the other, the other model, the other way of implementing it is uh, much more controlled. And so, general purpose systems—that's what we mean. We, we, we um, specifically, here's a slide that shows some elements that you might find in a game like ours, where somebody has thought out the relationships in advance. Like, well, the arrow does damage to the guard. It might cause a guard to drop a torch. <coughs> it might rupture a gas barrel. The fire arrow might do these things. The candle might do, do these things. And this is a representation of that same model, or that, that same set of entities with a different model. In this case, we have the arrow and the fire arrow uh, producing a piercing stimulus. And we have the uh, fire arrow also producing fire and the candle producing fire. And then we have the entities on the right set up to listen to various types of input. So this is a, a very special, special case model where somebody's thought through all the relationships. Maybe they missed some. Um, maybe some entities are added later. Maybe some combinations of entities can happen in the game that, that this doesn't handle. And this is a more general purpose input output um, a property-based input-output system. And so this is like a very simple abstract way of saying, um, you know, we don't have, we, we don't want to have had to think everything through and know all the relationships in advance, right? And so why do we do this? Um, what are the benefits? Uh, the, si si the systems in the game can resolve si uh, 
Oh my god, I don't even need to look at this kid. The systems resolve situations unplanned by the designer. Okay? So it takes the it takes the importance off the game designer and puts the importance on the player and the player's agency. Excuse me. Part of what I was getting at when I when I said initially I'm not sure how useful talks like this are. You have to take your own use away from it, you know, your own translation of it. Is that I know that there are ten different game developers with as much experience as I have or more who would tell you different things or opposite things, right? Some people, uh, you know, they value other other important things about games. Um, you know, maybe using uh, more personal subject matter or non-standard narrative or the focus very much on very directly influencing what the player is feeling at a given moment. And those games are completely valid and those are great directions to go in for games. Uh, you'll notice a very systems-oriented uh, approach that we have. And we're not against those things, and we do, in fact, dabble in all those other areas as well. Um, but anyway, so the benefits are that systems resolve situations unplanned by the designers. Um, and I'll give you some examples in a minute. New player tactics emerge, <coughs> and there are unique payoff moments. Um, we talk about drama a lot in games, right? You know, and, and film has drama, books have drama, like your life has drama. Um, there's a particular kind of drama that arises from manipulating or exploiting systems and being crushed by them or, or doing something interesting with them. It's an interactive form of drama. And so games like Dishonored definitely have embedded drama. They have like, oh, there's a big twist at this point in the story, and maybe you like this character because of the way the character's written and, and the backstory as, as you're told what the backstory is. But that moment that you bank a grenade around the corner and blow a bunch of rats up and several of the rats survive and one of the guards goes off to try to stomp the rat, like, and a, and a chain reaction happens that is driven by your actions, that is a different form of drama, right? That's more akin to the drama that can happen in the middle of a lacrosse game or something. It's a, it's a game drama. And so there'll be these unique payoff moments. That's another advantage. And at the end of the day, something we believe in very much is the player will feel ownership of the experience. Um, that you'll listen to the player talk about games. And this is especially true of multiplayer competitive games, but in this case, it's a systems-based single-player game. You'll hear people uh, talk about their experience, and they'll say, I did this, and then this happened, and then I did that as a response, and then this thing happened, right? It, I don't, I don't think they do the same, I don't think players talk the same way about games that are always the same every time you play them. You know, A happens, then B happens, then C happens, no matter what you do as a player. You either don't play the game or you follow A, B, C, right? I don't, I don't think pl players talk the same way about games. Uh, they talk with this excitement about, about games where you can recombine and manipulate and exert your agency um, because they own the experience at the end of the day. Uh, another benefit is there's more consistency, right? Like if you're using some sort of uh, general purpose input-output system, um, ideally uh, you don't have a moment <coughs> where like, you know, this thing doesn't set something on fire, but this does, right? If you're using, if you're using a system, uh, you know, if you're hard coding everything, if you're having to think through all the relationships, then somebody might have forgotten something, right? And so fewer arbitrary moments, fewer moments of like, why does this work this way? Um, in the same way that physics-based games, even if you pull out your iPhone again and play a, a you know, uh, you know, I was playing a six-figure golf game earlier, and it felt very consistent, right? Like no one scripted specifically any particular part of it. It's all based on uh, the way the ball hits the walls and the angle and the force and all that. So it's, it feels very consistent. Sometimes there are downsides to this general-purpose uh, approach that we have, though. There are some non-dramatic moments, right? Like if you're very much controlling um, a game in a very uh, traditional narrative way, then ideally if you do it well, you can cause you know rise and fall, a dramatic arc. In games like this, uh, you know we have this this feature called drop attack that is uh, <coughs> it works all based on like 
where you're at and how far you fall and when you attack specifically. But if you jump from on high, you can like you know uh, kill an enemy with a melee weapon as you as you fall on them. Um, and we could have set it up to be just like an automatic thing. Uh, some games have done that, and it's it's fine. Uh, it has its own kind of drama. But what often happens uh, if if a player doesn't do things exactly right is they end up with a non dramatic outcome, right? Like if the player just sits sits there and watches the guards do their thing, and then rushes out and attacks them and and, and plays this game like any other game. Uh, sometimes they kind of go, "What was the point of this? You know, I don't I don't get it. It didn't. Uh, nothing super cool happened, right? It, it requires some investment from a player. The more creative the player is, the more interesting it is, right? Um, and so once in a while, we end up with these non-dramatic moments. Some players are lost. Some players just don't know how to deal with this kind of kind of game. Um, they're used to action games, especially first-person action games, guiding them or putting them on rails and, and giving them a more or less a roller coaster experience. There's nothing wrong with roller coasters. It's just not what we do, right? Uh, those games don't feel improvisational to us. And so the players that are only trained to do that sort of thing, they, they feel lost sometimes. Again, this is another way of saying that the player is responsible, or you know, he or she is responsible for creating the fun in the game. <coughs> and this sort of stew um, requires enough entities with relationships, right? Like we've done this before where you put a number of things in the game, uh, like general purpose player tools, uh, particular weapons or trickery devices or mobility features. And if you don't put enough into the game that are interconnected, um, sometimes it feels a little flat. And so it requires like really thinking through the number of entities in the game and what their relationships, trying to overload the relationships. And then of course, occasionally it causes some sort of breakage or some sort of bug. <coughs> And there's, a, there's a, a brief section in a slide or two talking about which bugs we had to fix and which bugs we didn't have to fix. So our process in a very simple uh, way is we plan general purpose rules. Like uh, we go through the AI and say, hey, if a guard hears a sound, uh, they might go from a relaxed to a more guarded state. Uh, if they hear the sound again, they might come investigate this area. Uh, if they see a corpse or hear an alarm or hear somebody fighting in the distance, they'll respond in these ways. So we plan these rules, <coughs> we implement things, and we play for a while. Um, and th this sounds super simple, it sounds super basic, but what we do is we throw those things together without, without worrying about whether they're perfect. We throw them together and we just play. We let them live together for a while, the mechanics. Uh, and only later do we come in and add specific rules to support things or fix things if we need to. And we learn a lot about our game by uh, devising some, some thoughts, throwing things together, and even if it's broken or even if it feels unpolished, just by playing and living with it. Uh, there's a whole section in Dishonored in the middle where many things looked unpolished and many things felt broken. And we knew we'd patch this up or further support this cool thing that people were doing. But the value of it was several months into that, somebody would come up with something super clever and then we would add more code to support this or uh, a specific item or something that, that, uh, that took the role of that, that clever idea that the player had had. So we put things in place, fe put features in place in the context of the game. We let the systems live together even if they feel un unfinished. And uh, we add specific rules later to either fix things or patch them up to, to further support it. And I'll give you an example here uh, we had this, uh, we have this power of possession, right? Like if you take the power and you upgrade it, you can possess people. And what we decided to do was instead of leaving your body behind and seeing through their eyes or whatever, you physically incarnate in another person. So you, m you magically merge with them. And the reason we did it that way is we wanted you to be able to infiltrate with it, right? It's kind of a spy game. And, uh, so what happens is we play a, an eye animation that shows some optic nerves and light and you know make, plays a cool sound and you move into the uh, the you know the chef or guard or or bookkeeper or whoever you, in the world you're you're possessing. What we found that this player was doing was um, was like on the roof of a four or five story building and needed to get away because the alarm was going off and more guards were coming <coughs> and saw someone walking in the street below jumped and at the last minute possessed them. And it 
played the you know eye optic nerve thing and the his whisp magic whispering and then he was inside the body and walking along right and it was like you know that fall normally would have damaged him or killed him because he was already hurt but we just throw away the inertia of the player we get rid of the player's body and all that and so it felt really kind of sloppy at first it felt kind of broken but we liked it so much we liked it so much that the player had come up with this clever way to break a five-story fall and it, and it felt like a very dynamic version of something like the assassin's creed jump into a hay bale no one had a plan right like there was somebody on a patrol route below and this person improvised and they came up with a solution we didn't imagine because again the systems were fairly general purpose and so we had to decide should we fix this bug or should we support this bug? in our case we supported it right this is a feature not a bug to us by contrast, uh, there's a thing in the world called the Wall of Light, which is a Tesla-like security device with these big electrodes, and anybody who walks through it, the fiction is if the technical officers come by in the morning and let you rub some copper rod or whatever, then you're attuned to it and you can walk through it. So the player, of course, fries if he walks through it. It's like a bug zapper. Um, and the player can hack it and invert it so that guards fry when they walk through it and the player's free to move back and forth through it. And so all kinds of crazy, zany things happen when you, when you put a feature like this in the world. You, you put it in and immediately players do things like summon a swarm of rats and the rats all run at the guard on the other side of it and burn up as they go into it. And so, and we had this rule that was like, well, the more bodies that go through it, it has, it can't just be infinite, right? It, it burns up the whale oil tank power in it, right? So two swarms of rats and you could completely knock down a wall of light. This was like an, an emergent strategy that players figured out. Like, okay, there's a wall of light. I don't, I can't get through it. I don't have any hacking devices. Uh, I don't have this, I don't have that. I can't find the alternate route. The whale oil tank's on the other side of it, so I'm kind of screwed. Um, but I have the power of summoning rats, so I'm gonna do two swarms of rats and that's gonna, they're gonna all go through it and they're gonna die and that's gonna burn up the oil tank and, and, the, and the wall drops, right? Features like this, the general purpose features where you plan them and you kind of think through and then you say, what is the relationship to rats? What's the relationship to the, the whale oil tank? Uh, what are the relationship to the guard versus the player? You, you think things hap start happening that are just fun, you know, that are, that are just interesting. Well, one of them that happened was uh, the way the AI worked at the time was the guard could hear the player, the player maybe is standing even on the other side of the wall of light, right? And he inverts it. So now the wall of light is friendly to the player, he or she can walk through it, but the guards will burn up as, as they get near it. And then the player just hits the wall with a sword. And so a guard hears, he yells, another guard hears him. They all run and like eight guards in a row run through the wall of light and they all turn to ash, you know, as they hit it. And it sounds really cool, but like, it really wasn't much fun. It, it felt degenerate, right? Like, if every time I came to a wall of light, all I had to do was that, uh, it is an emergent strategy, and I guess in a, in a pure simulation, you would lose that, and it was fine. In our case, we decided to fix that. We decided <coughs> if a guard saw another guard burn up in it, he would conclude, that, thing, <laughs> <laughs> that thing's not right. I'm not gonna run through it, and so, <coughs> It's still fun because you get to burn one guy up, and and if you do it right, th the other guy coming around the corner might not have seen it, and then he goes through it, right? You have to time it right. But uh, but that's an example of general purpose stuff that we put in the game, and it didn't quite feel right, so we fixed it. So there, you have one case where we supported it, one case where we fixed it. And that's kind of our process, like throw things together, you know, plan things on a whiteboard, uh, think them through, think about their mechanics, think about their fiction, think about how they fit in the world. Uh, have a lot of fun, like thinking of all the things that could happen and then just slam it together and don't immediately fix everything that happened. Just let it live for a while. And you will find, through playtests, you will find some of, some of the things that you initially were like, oh God, we gotta fix that. Players are passionate, they love it, right? And so, and over time you'll figure that out and then you can fix the ones that you wanna fix and uh, support the ones that you wanna support. And I have a dozen stories about things that we ended up supporting or fixing, and we'll cover some more of those as we go. So in our case, talking about general purpose systems and why we think that they are the very heart and soul of games, um, here's
are some additional tips that we believe in. Avoid excessive math markups. And this might be very relevant to like <coughs> first person action games and third person action games. It is very easy if you're a programmer or a producer, again, um, it is a very solved problem to say, well, the way this works is the designer goes in there and he places an apple or whatever object you've got in your editor, and wherever that thing is, the player can do X. And therefore, we know it will work. Put it exactly the right height off the ground, but don't put it near this thing that otherwise the camera would clip through. We only use it in these th three levels because <coughs> otherwise it's, uh, it's overused or whatever, you know. And we, we absolutely avoid that. Like when we first started Dishonored, uh, we talked about timing uh, as, a, as a, uh, a mechanic, right? Like we have sprint, we have slide, we have lean, we have crouch, uh, um, and we have this climb mechanic, right? Where if you hold the jump and you're next to something, you can you know, push yourself up onto it, pull yourself up onto a, a, a roof ledge. There are many different ways we can implement this. And from what I've seen, I think most games of this nature have implemented it with markup. And you can tell. You can feel it. And what we did was a very clever programmer on our team wrote a bunch of algorithms and checks uh, and then optimized them so they weren't super slow so that it just does the math. It looks at the surfaces you're in front of and it says, is this the right angle? Uh, these are the acceptable angles. These are the non-acceptable angles and then the player can climb. And so it means the player can climb out of our game in places, which is obviously not great by itself, right? The player's on the other side of the world, falling through the world, you know, whatever. But, um, but we so prefer that because at the end of the day, we get out of the way, the player is on the stage, the player instantly sniffs out. The players feel this, right? I don't remember what year it was, but Will Wright said something about Players sense the possibility space. They immediately can tell whether this is like, okay, I can run forward in this narrow corridor and periodically I have a little input or whatever. Uh, that, and that's all that can happen, right? That, that's it. I either don't play the game or I do these five inputs. That, that's it. And by contrast, I mean, you look at the kids. If in, any of you that know kids, right, that watch them play Minecraft or Terraria, um, they immediately sense that this world is alive with possibility, that many different things are, are, are possible, many different outcomes are possible. And so we think avoid excessive map markup and instead do things algorithmically uh, is a general uh, a thing that more people should do. And again, design entities with multiple input-output relationships. Like if you think about it, um, we didn't try to put a thousand things into this game. We'd rather put like a hundred things into this game that are interconnected with, you know, some other number of things that we have in the conversation. If you think about rat swarms in our game, um, they have a relationship with light, they avoid it. They have a relationship with guards, they attack them. They have a relationship with corpses, they prefer them to guards and they devour them. Uh, they, you hide bodies, by the way, by summoning rats um, and the, the rats get rid of the body. Uh, they have a relationship with possession that was not, it's a super simple emergent example, but it was not initially what we thought of, right? Like I'm a player, I take possession at level one, which means I can't possess people, but I can possess animals, and I, and I take rats, uh, summon rat swarms. So immediately, you've given the player the ability to cleverly combine those things and go, I'll summon some rats, and then I'll possess one of them, and now I'm inside a rat. And I can run around, and I can use rat holes that are scattered through the world, and I can go under tables, and, uh, and I can move really fast. Um, and that, that even that level of simple player-driven combination, it's not like you got to a point in the game and the game said, to get past the next door, you must summon a rat. Here's a rat. Here's the scroll of rat possession or whatever. Like, I mean, not to sound judgmental, but that is not a game I want to play, right? The game that gives me general purpose tools and lets me be creative, that's the game I want to play. I just play it. And so uh, they also, rats obviously have a relationship with rat tunnels, and they have uh, a purpose related to escaping combat as much as anything. You can, uh, a slew of guards in Dishonored can be chasing you down a narrow street, and you can throw a pool of rats back, and the rats are just hanging out, and you take off. And as soon as the rats, uh, the guards stumble into them, you hear the cries and the shrieks and, you know, the death and mayhem behind you, but it's, it's a way to like escape from combat if you're wounded and let things settle back down. 
So again, this point, not to belabor it, but when you design an entity in the world, like, you know, maximize. Make sure, try to connect it to as many things as possible. Because w when things are running loose in this environment, uh, don't, don't go for puzzles that are key lock. Don't go for entities that are one to one. Uh, try to overload them with functionality related to other entities in the world. And then you can do fewer things actually, and you'll end up with more permutations. Okay, so that's the general purpose uh, game systems part of the talk, which is just an overview. We can get into it with Q&A. <coughs> you, might, you might remember a, uh, uh, <laughs> it's kind of a mean-spirited video that someone did at some point that was like uh, showing how cool Quake was. I don't know how many people here have played Quake. Like, is Quake a game that you guys played, or are you too young to <laughs> have played Quake? <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I got into games in 93, and I was 26, and I felt old for being in games at the time. Uh, I had just gotten out of the military, and the guys around me, I started at the bottom of the ladder. I was just in QA. Uh, so when people cite me at working on system shock, I was a tester on system shock. <laughs> uh, I was a peon. I learned a lot. I worked on the game with the team for 10 months, but I was, you know, again, I, I started at the bottom of the ladder. And uh, the people around me, some of them were 17. Some of them had never had a job. They literally came out of high school into video games. And, yeah, it just warped them forever, the people I knew that were like that. Um, <laughs> but I already felt old. And now I'm 46, you know, so it's just like, uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if you, what games you guys have, have, have are all familiar with or not. But anyway, so someone did that video of uh, how great Quake was. Um, you've probably seen the video. It shows the player running, rocket jumping, combining the jump and the rocket jump and, and navigating the level, flying through the level in this way that the team didn't initially plan. It's a highly mobile game. And mobility, like physics, like uh, AI, are, are very much related to the dynamics of gameplay. And, uh, and at the end of the video, it says, what happened? You know, because this was a game from like, I don't know, what year did Quake come out? Anybody? 96, was it? Okay, so this was a game from 96. And in some ways, games got less highly mobile, less agile after that. They got less general purpose after that. And the, a lot of games in the late 90s and early aughts, right, felt less than that. So what happened? And so we love Quake. We love games. Even, even, even Skull has been singing a piece that referenced an old song. He goes, you know, those were the games that Laugh and I and the team at Arcane, we, we cut our teeth on and we really loved. And so this Italian guy put this series of videos out, and all he does is combine our game systems in a way that, like, we can't do. Right, like even even our testers were impressed by this. Uh, so this is violent subject matter. It's it's a power fantasy. It's a dark, gritty, corrupt, polluted world full of power abuse and murder and all that. But you could just as easily imagine this game with mushroom people or green spheres or s springs and you know like you could you could make it very abstract. You could make it very uh, uh, themed like the Nintendo might theme it. You know you could do so what you're about to see is very violent, but it is an example of the player using our jump, our slide, uh, stopping time, sicking rats on people, uh, using our drop attack, all of these things at a virtuoso level. Skull's rat, stop time, jump combined with blink, Jump combined with blink, drop attack. That's one of the guys fighting off the rats. Time is resumed at this point. of this isn't that 
wow, that's violent. You know, again, this could have been this could have been you know bouncing on mushrooms and grabbing cubes in the air, or stars, or whatever. The point of this is that this guy is like a ballet dancer. You know, this uh, this guy that put these videos up. So expressive with the way he plays, right? Like, there are many games that give you like a hallway and a locked door and a lever that literally is non-interactive until you have a conversation, and then then it magically comes on, and the door only opens when the monster is killed. And the monster can only be killed with the chain gun, and the player can only go straight down the hall or whatever, right? And this is a game we like to think where the player is turned loose in an environment. Uh, there are multiple pathways. There are multiple general purpose tools. There's different ways to approach it. The same player could have stealthed this entire area and not killed anyone, right? And so it's about letting players do things, letting the player be creative. <coughs> okay, so the next part of the talk, um, and you know, again, I, I gave you the overview of why we love what we do and why we're still, after all these years, fascinated by this kind of thing. And general purpose systems aren't new, but um, sometimes we let them as game developers, we let them fall by the wayside. And so I've tried to give you and examples, <coughs> examples of why we think they're important and what they do for the player. Now we're going to talk about the other thing that we think is the heart and soul of the types of games we love. And I think it's applicable to non-first-person games. I think it's applicable to a lot of games. Uh, we call it the play path matrix. That is like the matrix of possibilities that exist when you combine the play tools against the, the nonlinear pathways that you can follow. It's just another way of talking about nonlinear mission environments. <coughs> what we mean. So um, we try to provide multiple gameplay tools or approaches. And in Dishonored specifically, you can talk about the stealth uh, approach or the combat approach. Even within those two, you can be lethal or non-lethal. You can always use ranged weapons or get up close. <coughs> if you if you maximize your possession power, if you take that up, uh, you can really use it for pretty through almost every situation in the game. Uh, blink, bend time, hacking security devices, slow going slow or sprinting, uh, pickpocketing in a pickpocketing a key to get to an area instead. All of those things take different approaches. They enable different player activities, and they're all in, they're all available in the same environment. Um, and what this uh, this play path matrix thing is it's that stuff complemented by multiple adjacent pathways. <coughs> so in one environment, we might have a front door, a rooftop path, a back alley, a window, a waterway underneath the building. And uh, together, these things make an interesting possibility space. And I'll give you examples. At any time, the player can make choices. We very, very seldom do we have a, a, a place where it's just go down this hall and do this thing, and this is the way you have to do it. Um, <coughs> you can constantly choose which differentiated power or tool uh, to employ, what your tactical approach is going to be. Are you the player that's like hiding, leaning out around the corner, listening, waiting for the guards to walk away? Uh, are you the, the direct rush uh, approach? Are you leveraging the security devices in the world, like when that guy walks close to that thing, I can make it explode. You're also interpreting the situation morally. Uh, like, uh, I'll talk at length about that in a minute. But you can decide, you can decide, are these abstract game entities that I should see as a challenge and eliminate all of them? Or are they people that I want to, that I think are just doing their jobs and I want, you know, I want to spare as many of them as possible? Uh, and then which pathway to take. Like I said, if, if an area is riddled with pathways, it makes your job harder as a developer because you have to uh, trap when the player is passed through an area. You can't boom a bottleneck all the time. But it does give the player choice. And the benefit, again, is that the player owns more of the experience. It's not about the designer. It's about the, it's about the player. <coughs> and our process for this is we try to identify the, the play styles or watch players and e evaluate what they're doing, uh, see what's emerging from the test bed, and then we try to support those things pervasively, everywhere, constantly, uh, not on discrete tra discrete tracks. We, we try not to have the stealth door or the combat to become the way we would have had to 
try to do like you can go through either of these two doors and both of them will have available content for you throughout. And in fact, sometimes you're going there because of something that happened because of something you did. Uh, we also try um, to not be too predictable. Like sometimes you play a game and it's like some some designer has figured out a pattern. Like I'll put an apple in every dumpster, and then every time you open the dumpster, there's an apple in it, and it just sort of kills the the, the exploration value, I guess. Uh, so we try to break patterns like that. <coughs> and so our process again, we riddle the world with multiple adjacent pathways. We give you uh, general purpose tools. We allow you to uh, employ a variety of play styles, and we allow you to do that constantly everywhere, not just on discrete tracks. Another thing we do is we randomize the mission goals or objectives. Like this is something that computers do very well, but it's very easy. It does complicate things a little bit, but it, it seems oddly uncommon. Uh, we have situations in Dishonored where, uh, I mean, Raph and I certainly are big fans of this, but a lot of this is owed to our lead level designer, uh, Christoph Carey, who's been working with us on some of the foundation of the company. Um, Christoph worked on Arcs and Dark Messiah and a little on Bioshock 2 uh, and certainly on Dishonored. <coughs> but um, one of the things that he began to advocate about, like if you look at Dishonored, the mission where you go to the bathhouse to hold the golden cat, the Pendleton twins uh, can be in one of like several different locations. And you as the player can get there and eavesdrop to learn where they're at. Ah, Lord Custis Pendleton is with Violet in the music room tonight, you know, uh, telling stories or whatever. Oh, no, no, no. In, in another playthrough, he's down in the steam room. Um, and if you think about how many, how many systems that employs, I mean, of course, back to the downside of, of this approach, the player could just get there and run room to room to room to room and, and kill everybody along the way and finally find the target, right? Um, <laughs> But like, I'm hiding under the stairwell, I'm waiting, two characters come in, I lean out to listen to their conversation, we've randomized the targets, um, the player gathers the information, and then the player waits for the characters to leave, quietly moves up the stairs to go to where I've been told this guy's there. Um, so just by randomizing the, the mission objectives, even if it could be in one of three rooms, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a powerful thing. Again, the player owns more of the experience because it's a little different each time. It's a little more engaging. Replay is possible or, or more likely. Uh, and this is a point that uh, my friend uh, Raph and I were talking to Doug Kirk about uh, the game. And um, Doug was very good at, at, you know, saying, yeah, that you've just covered the basics of why you do those things. But here's the, the bonus version uh, that we didn't think about. But just kind of do intuitively. Um, if you randomize the location of your goals, like say you have a house, and instead of always putting the target in the kitchen uh, or a hidden object or whatever it is, you, it could be in one of three places and your system handles that. Another ancillary benefit of that is you as the designer can't overstrip the kitchen, right? You can't say like, well, because I always know the player will be in this area, I'm going to put tons of effects on this area particle effects are usually a thing, you know, like get the lighting just right, because I know this is like the super important moment, right? If it could be in three different locations, my time is split, and I can't be so cinematic with it, right? And what that what that means is, yeah, sure, it doesn't look as, as um, you know, sexy or cinematic, you know, when I go to the kitchen to find the hidden object or whatever, but at the same time, because it can be in three different places, it's more about the player. It's more about the player than, it's, than it is about you, the designer, the auteur, right? And so a secondary benefit here is that we as level designers and artists cannot overstrip an area if that area is only one of several locations that the target can be in. Uh, a good example in Dishonored, already mentioned the Pendleton twins can be in several different locations, the steam room or, or every time you play, they're in one of three or four locations. <coughs> but there's a mission called Lady Moira Black Party where there's a powerful, corrupt, aristocratic woman who is funding the military for the tyrant. 
And if her support goes away, the military kind of turns on them because they're not being paid. And she is uh, one of three sisters, and they are throwing a, a huge party in the middle of the worst plague in the hi history of the city. People are starving, uh, and they're partying, and they're having a costume ball, right? So she's very much shown to be um, a corrupt figure. And not only are the party guests moving around constantly, so if you want to go to the Commission District, it's actually uh, you have to control yourself. You have to like restrain yourself, and you have to move around and listen. But also, uh, the women are wearing different colored dresses that night. They had custom masks and dre uh, dresses and outfits. So it's an odd detail that women in our world dress in. Our art director at some point said the dress was never developed. All the women wear pants. It's just a stylistic thing that he wanted to do. And so it's, it's, it's the way in which it's got a Victorian world and a Tudor Victorian world, right? It's, it's one of those little details. But anyway, so <coughs> I got bogged down in a, a control riff for a second. I'm sorry. But um, – there, there are three different colors, right? And so it, it randomizes that. And so you can go to their rooms and read clues about who is who, and you can figure out which one is the actual Lady Boyle who is funding the military for the, the tyrant. And so just by moving characters around and by alternating the identity between these, these three villains, uh, you change it up for the player, and you get these benefits. And again, this is just part of our process. Like, if you think about it, <laughs> if you're already going to put a target or a hidden o object or some goal in an area, um, you know, you could make an entire focus of your game to, to randomize that first thing. Um, another point, and I said I would get to part of this, uh, yeah, it's the example, um, is leave enough, play l leave enough space for player-driven goals. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean Hey, player, here's three different goals. Pick one. <coughs> it does mean that. But it also means uh, player-imposed goals. That is, we don't necessarily reward you for this, but it is a way you can do things. And you might find value as the player in that. Um, not necessarily that there's an achievement goal, although in some cases there might be because we want to formalize the position of it or something. What we really like is when it's just possible for you to decide, I'm going to play the game this way. I'm going to do this character this way just because you want to. Just because you think that's kind of a cool idea. And so we have players doing things like, I'm not going to take any of this different into account. I'm going to play the whole game with flesh and steel. Uh, I'm going to uh, ghost the game. That is, I'm not just going to finish the game. I am literally going to be the thing that the stealth community calls ghosting, where not only was I not did I not kill anyone uh, as far as this person went? What it means is no AI ever noticed me. They, ever, they never went into alert status, right? There he is. Um, so you can, you can play our game by ghosting versus using some sort of imperfect stealth, which is what a lot of people do, kind of a lion rush, where you try to sneak, and when things go bad, you, you go violent. A lot of <laughs> <laughs> I've heard from a 1,000 players that are like, you know, I, I had the best intentions when I approached the music. <laughs> <laughs> the guard was in there. He was playing the piano. The other guy was the one that came and got his fire. My intention was to leave them both alive, but <laughs> I knocked a glass over, and <laughs> then there were heads on the floor. And <laughs> and you know, that's, that's imperfect stealth <laughs> versus the player who can just go, you know what? I really like, like, see that guy? Stick the grenade to the head, boom, and that's <laughs> it. So it's nothing but shooting and stabbing and, and you know grenades and that sort of thing. And so we leave that range there. That's possible. It's it's not like you have to do one to complete a level or not. It's 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 that that range exists because we want you, the player, to decide how the game should be played. Uh, but again, I've, I've just listed a bunch. Very murderous versus completely non-lethal. It was one of our strongest goals to make a game about an assassin where you didn't have kill anyone. Um, and in fact, we gave you an ending where the kingdom was more stable if you won. Uh, we kind of took a stand on uh, on that. I know a lot of people were seemed to respond to it. They really liked it. And then we did hear from people that said, why are you punishing us? You know, I play the way I want, and then I got a bad, uh, a bad, a bad ending. Uh, we don't see it as there is a bad ending, right? We don't see that there's a great ending. But um, we see that there are consequences for your actions. 
if you imagine a novel where the guy gets up in the morning and he murders everyone in the house and he goes down the street and murders everybody on the way to work and then he kills everybody in the office and then at the end he gets a medal and is the hero and everything works out re- really good in the novel. It's all, it all works out very well. Like, that's ridiculous. No one would, no one would write a book like that. No one would read a book like that. Uh, and yet, we kind of do that in games constantly. Like they just kind of <laughs> And so we, you know, we said, hey, we can, be, we can be the hero and power fantasy your way through the game and murder everyone that you, that you get your hands on and, and win that way. But it's a very dark, uh, it's a very dark path that you see. You can stay in your life. The government is crushed. Like, the plague goes on, et cetera. Or you can be very cautious, uh, kill only the people who need killing or kill no one, and you get through the game and you've accomplished your goals in some other means. And our, our take is that that is inherently a more stabilizing way to play the game. That's a, w- a way to leave the world in a more stable state. Um, and so we, we actually took a stand on that, and we, we got a lot of positive complimentary, uh, uh, you know, compliments for it, but we also got a little backlash. Um, but again, that's another way that the player, we left a space for how the player wants to play, right? Um, and then also the, the slow pace versus fast, of course, you can sprint through some parts of the game. <coughs> the speed runs for this game are incredible because of the supernatural powers that go over the top. Uh, I encourage you to look at YouTube and watch people do things that we wouldn't think were possible. Um, the story absor- absorption versus action. You can approach this game where like, you're like, hey, I want to play Dishonored and I want to fight and sneak and kill my way through the game versus I want to understand the calendar months. We got emailed the other day because we, made, we, we, we might have made a mistake in the calendar. Like, we said this happened in the month of Nex, but in the month of High Cold, this, you know, and some player was like, wait a second. You know, it's like, <laughs> wow, you know. Um, so, again, there's, there's that spectrum for how you can a- a- approach the game. And the example we want to give, I want to give, uh, that Raph and I put together for this particular part of, of our process about leaving enough space for the player um, is this device called the part where carry around the supernatural artifact and pull it out and uh, you can use it to find runes and bone tomes like it's primary purpose. But we also wanted to do this thing where if you point it at somebody and squeeze it, <coughs> it whispers something about that person. <coughs> and generally in high chaos where you've been very violent, it whispers some dark secret about you. Uh, you know, like you drown a bunch of corpses or whatever. In low chaos, where you've been very cautious and very non-lethal, it says something like, if you have children waiting at home, you're just going to go home and feed them if you survive through this game. You know, that, that's the kind of thing <laughs> about the common guard, right? And players, to our surprise, started using that as the litmus for whether they should kill people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they'd go into the world, you know, they would, they would sort of do a detection on the guy and decide, ah, you, you deserve to die. Or, or they, would, they would spare the person. <laughs> Honestly, we, 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 you know, we, we speculated at one point. I remember Seth Rodano Team is a uh, game designer tuned this stealth, speculating that people might play that way. And uh, but but it was a it was a surprise that, that we heard it so commonly, right? Um, so this device leads players to bone charms and ruins, which is a tool for pulling them off the main path. By the way, because you can scatter things out in little corners that otherwise the player wouldn't go to, the player will find that their way there. It fa- factors into the player's attitude and morality, as I said, <coughs> and it um, just gave us a vehicle for telling more story, right? Like very quick, less than tweet length, you know, lines of dialogue about a particular character. So Common Guard becomes a person who was abandoned by his family on, you know, in, in Gunwall and, and, and uh, became a guard. <coughs> and so this, this was all about leaving enough space for the player to approach the game how he or she wants. Okay, so I'm going to – I don't know how long that was. Uh, hopefully that wasn't – I feel like I rushed a little at the beginning, but hopefully that got all the points across. And if not, we can, we can hit that in questions. Um, I just want to say that we as developers, both me and Rafael Paul Antonio and Arcane – uh, we believe very strongly in, in this stuff. We believe in guiding the player instead of dictating to the player. 
Uh, we believe in general purpose systems, tools and entities that can be used creatively. We think that's the heart of gameplay. We don't think it's the only part of games. Uh, we don't think formalization of, of games or systems is the only way to approach games. Riding in the back of a car as a kid with my little brother, and every time we saw a particular kind of car, we made a strange animal noise, it's like, oh, that's kind of cool, right? We didn't have to have a big, huge movie. It's not a very formal game, but it's a game. You would never, you would never turn to a kid and say, you guys are mad because we just made a scary noise. It's, it's a very spirit of, 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 of games, you know? So there are many different types of games possible. Um, but we, we believe that you should create tools and entities that can be used creatively because it should be about the player. Um, we believe in this thing called the play path matrix. Multiple adjacent pla pathways complemented by player tools <coughs> that can be used in variable ways. And, and our goal really with a game like Dishonored um, is a dynamic story derived from the player's actions. Um, you know, yes, there is an embedded story also. You know, the, the bodyguard of the Empress is accused of her murder, etc. But there's that story where it's like, I pulled myself up onto a wall and I knocked the body over. And around the corner, I heard a guard say, hey, what was that? And heard him start walking towards me. Uh, and I was like, I'm on this wall. I'm about to get busted. But at the last moment, I saw a rat go by. And I was like, what's this rat doing? You know, I tried to move around the guard and he tried to stomp me, you know. And the game generally, those three things are like, you're all shit. And they try to, you know, they try to stomp rats and produce these ghosts. And all of that happened and it felt very dynamic. You know, no one scripted that game or planned it, right? It was like, populate the world, put these guys on semi-randomized patrols, give the player some tools. The players happen to choose the tools that facilitated that particular story. And so our goal is a dynamic story derived from player actions. And as I said earlier, this is an interactive game with drama. This is drama. This is a drama you create. And there's that sense the player sort of infers that anything could happen here. That's one of the exciting things about games. Um, and we, we do provide traditional story elements or embedded narrative um, to give the, the game context, right? Uh, to pull the player into kind of a mythic story or a setting that is familiar. And uh, one of our primary goals is just to allow players to play creatively to solve things in ways we didn't uh, intend or anticipate. <coughs> the simplest example is Jump Plus Blink. When we first put those things together, we give you the ability to sprint and jump so you can run toward the edge of the roof and jump off. And at the apex of the jump, when you're going to fall, so to speak, you activate the blink, which is like a short-range sort of teleport. The players started combining those two things almost intuitively. They just started doing that. And they could cross vast distances in our game. Like if they took double jump, that power, they upgraded it, and then they took blink, and then they upgraded that power. The player could take a running start, jump, and then like as they're sailing through the air, blink to a far balcony. And it was like a bit terrifying because it was like, oh, my God. You know, like we had a guy at E3, like we, we had this setup at E3 where we were working with FBI and Allied and Sony, and we were like polishing this piece of content in advance to, to get it ready for E3. And we had people running through this, and some people were spending hours trying to get to this uh, Sokolov greenhouse that he was at. And uh, it was on a, on a, a, a map called The Bridge. It's up in the city. <coughs> and people would do all kinds of things. We, just, we saw things we didn't expect. We saw a lot of people follow one of three or four paths that we kind of expected, one of you know, several power combinations or, or game mechanic combinations. But this one guy came up, and he said, um, hey, I... Uh, I just started the demo and I think I'm at the end of it. What happened? And we were like, what'd you do? And it just so happens that he started, the, the playthrough started, immediately for whatever reason, turned and climbed up the wall, sprinted, jumped, sprinted, jumped, and was at the greenhouse saying Sokolov was there. And he was like, the guy was there and I just, I grabbed him, you know? And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> you have some people spending literally like, the average was like 45 minutes through that chunk of, of map and you have this guy who I think did it in less than like two minutes or whatever you know and it was <laughs> like but again this is the this is the kind of thing we, we this is you could list this as a downside but it's but it's the price you pay for letting the player have some control right 
And so uh, the other example I gave earlier was possessions has fallen. Like players combine that, and uh, we love seeing that. You know, I'm going to fall off the building, but at the last minute, I think to possess that guy walking below, and uh, it breaks my fall, and I've, I've used the game system in a way that no one ever overtly spelled out for me. So, uh, I, I all, you know, Raph and I decided to leave <coughs> one last example here at the end uh, because, to be honest, the game is a combination of things, right? It's a combination of things other than just this. And, uh, and some people could see that as a weakness. It's a combination of just different things. It's not pure simulation. It's not pure emergent uh, story based on exploration. It's, a com it's, a, it's an inelegant, sometimes inelegant combination that just so happens to be when it works, the kind of game that just really excites us. And so there's this section at the, uh, in, the, in the game where you're going after a tyrant in a highly guarded facility. And we've seen players do so many different things there. It's, it actually is one of the more popular levels done by a guy named Marcy Martinez along with Chris Carrier and a bunch of artists. Our lead uh, environmental artist, Renee Elan, who's brilliant at this stuff. And uh, they work together on this, this environment. And it kind of combines all the things we talked about tonight. Um, the Lord Regent in high chaos is up in a safe room because he's worried about security. In low chaos, he's chilled. He's he's telling his guards, like, hey, Renee, like, I think I'll just hide ahead in tonight. There's no need for the extra security. So things have been pretty calm lately in, in Dunwall. So we're going to be in two different locations. Uh, he is on a simulated path through the world. We don't do the thing where, like, when you open the door, we teleport the monster into place or whatever. He is literally, like, you can turn on see-through wall vision and, and watch him walk around. And so players will enter this environment. They'll get through the courtyard. They'll go past all the security systems. They'll get into the building. <coughs> and they will, like, move into the big area where the Lord Regent is somewhere in the distance. And some players will, like, fight their way up the stairs, causing him to panic and run. Immediately triggers, I, get, I better get to the safe room behavior. We have uh, other players that will <coughs> sneak their way. We see some players do things like get into the chandeliers, and at one point he comes to the balcony of his bedroom and says some things, and they realize, like, wow, he's right there across the two more chandelier hops, and I'm, I'm in his bedroom. And, uh, you know, we have players do things like sneak into the bedroom and get on top of the canopy bed and then watch him through the walls as he walks past one room after another where he says, like, Ah, the Empress and I took tea here many times and talked about a great many of things. You know, he has his, like, bits of story that he adds to the world. And if he comes into the room and the safe is open, but his belongings are still in it, he will say, who opened this, and close it. If he sees in the room the safe's open and his belongings are gone, he sneaks out, sounds an alarm, runs for the safe room, right? If it, along the way he sees a body, he freaks out, he sound, sounds an alarm, the guards come running. Uh, if, if he hears fighting, he does the same thing. So it's... <clears throat> the point of this example is not just that it is all the things I've talked about, um, but it is also a combination of scripting and AI and general physics stuff, right? Like that thing with the safe is not just AI, right? That is like scripting. That is us saying, hey, we've lived with this level for a long while. We know the kinds of things that happen here. There's not an infinite number of things that can happen here. Um, the, the Lord Regent can walk into the room, not see the player, but see the safe open with the safe robbed or not robbed. Let's support those things. So there's a bit of scripting there, right? It's like, hey, let's directly support this thing. And then there's AI running as well. Like, I haven't heard any threat, so I'm going to, like, uh, move around in my environment. Uh, or I'm hearing a threat, therefore I'm going to run to this area. That it's, it's a combination, right? And it's a combination – <coughs> in the support of creating an, a specific kind of illusion, but at the same time letting the player break into that illusion and improvise and look for themselves. And so that is uh, that is the end of our, our talk that we put together that I gave tonight. Um, I appreciate you staying with me. Um, and I guess uh, should we do Yeah, let's, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, sure, have a, have a Uh, a couple questions.
questions, and then we'll have a little conversation. We'll open it up to the uh, to the uh, general public for Q and A. Um, so, uh, first of all, just congratulations. It's a wonderful game. Thank you. Um, and uh, it was just fun to see it, uh, see the enthusiasm that, that it generated. Um, I think when, when I, um, so we have a, a class here at, uh, at, in the Game Center called Games 101, which is almost like an art history survey of the whole history of games. And uh, we have one lecture which is on first person uh, as, a, as a genre and as a topic and a technique. And um, when we talk about first person, um, there's a term we use uh, that uh, I call the, the looking glass legacy, um, which is uh, very much, uh, I think, what uh, Dishonored I see as, as sort of carrying on the tradition of, of the, all the stuff you talked about, which is focus on player improvisation and creativity, uh, multiple solutions to, to problems, uh, emergence, uh, and systems like a full uh, like a commitment to systems, and yet without uh, w without losing sight of, of scripted story, like an, an attempt to sort of dial both of those things up to eleven. Right. You have the environmental storytelling and this rich world, uh, and and a really uh, interesting uh, theme and context. But then you also have all these uh, emergent game systems, and uh, so I guess first of all, I think it's 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 a, a, a super challenging to design games like that, which is one of the reasons we don't see a lot of them. Um, you, you, you know, I, I think they are, in many ways, they, they represent uh, what I would say is the kind of the progressive end of, of the game design spectrum. When I think of the people like you, uh, Clint Hawking, um, you know, to a certain degree, Warren Spector, you know, the people who are really interested in that approach, um, I think of them as being the people who are uh, really interested in, in, uh, in, in innovating in game design and evolving. Um, I just, I, one question I have is, is uh, are there other examples of, of, of games that you look at as kind of inspiration uh, uh, outside the, so when, obviously things like Thief, Deus Ex, you know, games that you worked on and, and, um, and, and were, were a part of uh, that, that history, but are there other examples of, of games that you think of in this style that you look to uh, for inspiration? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> I have to, like, cite Raph here, but he, um, you know, we're both big fans, like I said, of, of all the first-person stuff. Dungeon Master was a game that came out in 87 that did a lot of this, but in the, you can move one square at a time, can rotate, you know, I don't know if you remember that game, but uh, Underworld was, felt like the first smooth-scrolling version of this, this kind of thing. Um, <coughs> but Raph often talks about the Ultimas, and I was an Ultima fan, um, but I think he's a bigger Ultima fan than I am. <coughs> and that whole thing about you can go in and, like, kick some wheat and take it over to the oven and start the fire and put the wheat in the oven and, you know, do, do all the – mix it and put it all together. Like, that sort of combining things and, like, uh, you know, the dream of, like, <coughs> these monsters inhabit this area because of this – plant or fish or whatever is there and if you kill that thing they wander off and find another version of mm. it uh, I don't know why that's so fascinating it's kind of an ecological thing yeah um, but certainly he would if Raph was here tonight he would talk about Ultima uh, and I, I have written you know I thought I had written a lot about Far Cry 2 but I realized that most of it had been email to Clint or <laughs> or like conversations in the design fit or whatever with coworkers. So recently, I wrote up some of the thoughts that I had on, on developer bulletin boards too, I guess. And I, I recently wrote some of that up about why I thought Far Cry 2 specifically was really brilliant. <coughs> In a nutshell, it does a lot of these same things, but it, everybody who works on this kind of game for a while, after a while realizes that narrative and systems don't play well together generally. That's not to say that they don't have to. <coughs> it's just that generally they don't. So some people's response to that is to throw their hands up and say, <coughs> I'm going to work on, on game games, like formal games. And by the way, Raph told me to tell you, he's like the world's biggest Drop 7 fan. Oh, nice. Like I, I <laughs> love Drop 7, and I turned him onto it. And at first yeah. he was frustrated. Like yeah. This was years ago, and he was like, I kind of don't see why you keep playing this game. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, he's played – Ten times more than I have. <laughs> That's the curve. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. <coughs> he told me to tell you that oh, Drop nice. Seven is brilliant. But 
Do, is this thing on? Do we get that? Do we get? Is that we recording? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're recording. Thank you. And so, some people throw their hands up and they say those two things should never be mixed. I'm going to go make systems games or classic games or formal games of some other type, right? Or, or they say, you know what? I don't care about games. I want to create an interactive emotional experience and that's going to be my focus. And that is absolutely uh, as valid. You know, you, you should follow your interests. And uh, something an art history teacher told me one time was that <coughs> we're obsessed with like how fast we're moving as games and whether we're going to like end up in some sort of power fantasy ghetto or whether we're going to actually transcend and become like classical music where people play games and talk about them the way they talk about chess, right? Chess is a game and they already talk about it that way, by the way, but whatever. <laughs> um, <coughs> and I, the, my art history teacher at one point told me that it took photography a hundred years to recognize itself as an art. I don't absolutely know that that's a fact, but I've been quoting it a lot, so <laughs> <laughs> so I hope she wasn't lying. Um, and by contrast, games have been moving very fast toward something, trying to achieve some sort of meaning. And some people will tell you that meaning's been there all along, right? Like the, the interactive drama that you get out of going all in in poker and like, you know, that tense moment and and, you know, it paid off or it didn't pay off or you got to see something about the person's personality as you did this, you know, all, all of those things. Like marveling at the way systems sometimes come together or feed, feed off of each other. Yeah. It's already there. I, I, I think it, <coughs> it might be John Blow who I first saw talking about Osmos. And, uh, you know, it's the little iPhone game. Or I guess it wasn't an iPhone game initially, but it um – <laughs> Andy Nealon, one of the one of the guys who made it. So, really, he, he could tell. What, it, what was the first platform? It's not about me. You guys <laughs> yeah, what was the first platform? We're just doing a reality check. What is uh, it's on the PC, it's right? Based on Steam. Yeah, so yeah, it's on Steam. Yeah. So I'm about to say something very complimentary. Oh. Uh, <laughs> when people talk about elegance and systems design, Osmos is like the poster child for that, right? Like, you know, as you move toward. Um, these entities that you want to consume if you're larger, the way you propel yourself is you output part of yourself and you therefore shrink. And it, it just like is mind-blowingly beautiful, like as a system. And I think John Blow was the first person that pointed that out, not to me just tweeting about mm -hmm. it. And I, I went and got the game and mm -hmm. absolutely fell in love with it. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can have many different reactions to this thing about do narrative and, and systems go together. Yeah. And I, I think that, the, I've, what, what I've said for a while, like, and I think other people have said too, is like everybody do their thing and we'll get to where we're going because there's already a massive amount of um, inertia toward finding more and more meaning and arguing meaning in games, uh, which to me I take as a sign that things are, are moving in the right direction, are healthy. You know, The fact that I can talk about emergent narrative and point to last year's FTL, one of my favorite games, and say like all my friends were coming in and telling stories about I couldn't figure out what to do the fire was spreading so I opened all the airlock and my I knew that everybody would die in the crew except the rock guys who didn't need to breathe and like those are systems making a story for that player based on the agency of the player you know yeah you once gave a talk which uh, I found deeply inspirational I think it was called the luckiest people in the world mm. where you talk about how great it is to be alive right now if you are a game designer or just a lover of games uh, to be living in this era where games are going through the evolution they're going through and uh, it's, 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 a, it's amazing, right? I mean, do you think of yourself as an optimist in that sense? Like, It's not, it's not just being optimistic. It's, I'm going to pull up a quote from Janet Murray here. I'm not checking my Twitter or whatever. <laughs> you, you can't. Um, wait, where is it at? I know it's here somewhere. Um, I think she said this nine years ago today or something, uh, coincidentally. Um, I did want to uh, ask you a question in a minute, by the way, but um, <laughs> I won't give you the whole quote. Well, I guess I can. Um, sure. In the end, it does not matter what we call such new artifacts as the Sims, Facade, or Kabul Kaboom. Dollhouses, stories, cyber dramas, participatory dramas, interactive cartoons, or even games. The important thing is we keep producing them. 
It is a rare, this is the part I wanted to quote. Okay. And this is why it's so exciting. It is a rare, it is rare in human history that a wholly new medium of representation comes into our hands. Like, you are here now as this is happening. You know, like, I mean, when's the last time this happened? You know, it, it, it's amazing. Um, let us not, ah, let us not welcome it with an academic turf wars. Mm. I love that terminology. Yeah. Obviously, this is a person with tons of experience in a world that I haven't yeah. been in, like yeah. academia, where you can yeah. see people get entrenched in their position, yeah. begin to to name call in very polite, sophisticated yeah. ways, <laughs> and sure. lead yeah. people in different directions. You yeah. Know? yeah, Jenna Murray's actually quite good at academic turf wars, by the way. Don't, don't, don't let the quote fool you. She said, let us not waste our time with these. She's, <laughs> that was a, that was a, she was striking a blow in one of them when she said that. Yeah. So let us resist. <laughs> let us resist the temptation to define it in terms of legacy practice, either critical or creative. Instead, let us bring to it every analytical and creative approach we have, a plurality of approaches, right? Uh, in a global collaboration to expand the range of human expressiveness and the capacities of human understanding. Wow, so, like, beautiful. it's yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me let me drill down real quick to, to like a, to a technical point about your process. I'm fascinated by your process. So you have the, you're doing work in this style, which I think is really challenging. Um, you you look at a game like Dishonored. It's huge. It's very big. It's ambitious on multiple levels. Is that and is that a game just in terms of your process? For example, is that a game where you use design documents? Are you and Raph writing things? Yeah. So um, the sort of like. The level of prototyping that Raph does is uh, more significant than what I had encountered before. And as I said, I, I learned a tremendous amount from him, and I think he learned some from me. But but he, he him having worked in so much first-person Melee, uh, I mean, he might be the world's foremost video game first-person sword Melee guy, you know? Um, but... Uh, as a result, it's done tons of prototyping and will often do the thing where it's like, let's just try this. I know it sounds crazy, but let's just try this. And a week goes by while we try it, and sometimes it bears fruit. Uh, and we both, over the course of 20 years of making games, have tried every approach, right? Like, I remember when people made fun of monolithic design docs as mm -hmm. being... Like, we had a design doc on Deus Ex that literally would crash most of the machines in the building. Like, it got so bloated with graphics right. and quotes. And, and nowadays, people, like, <coughs> don't really make design documents. That yeah. seems to be the conventional wisdom. And so then people went uh, wiki. Mm -hmm. And then yep. I worked on a project where we were exclusive wiki, and it drove me mad mm -hmm. because yeah. I couldn't find anything. Yeah, and it's people, not great. People right? would duplicate, yeah. uh, you know. I mean, I guess if it's small, it would be fine. But if it's if it's a big game, like oh my god, you find another the same list, octopused out in another area yeah. or whatever, it and then yeah. and then people went with like wow we don't need design docs. And my whole process is one page. Yeah, here's the design doc. That's right. all the design doc. <laughs> <is>. <laughs> it's, like, it's like well, and so I have to tell you we still use monolithic design <laughs> docs. All right, like, fair enough. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted to hear. We we so there is somewhere a big. Honkin yeah. thing where you can turn to a page and be like, oh, that's but what this room has to have in it. Or but I have to say, it quickly falls out of date, and we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we write a bunch of stuff, and in the process of writing it, we feel different about it by the end than at the beginning. And we rewrite it multiple times, and we feel very different. And then later, months later, we realize the section's gone stale, and we don't care about it anymore. So you're not pr precious about trying to keep it up to no. date. And then, and then yeah. somebody begins to prototype. And the, meanwhile, level designers are also doing their thing over here. And very quickly, that takes the lead, right? Very quickly, that's the thing. Uh, and then at some point near the end of the project, we go like, oh, God, we were going to do this thing. Oh, <laughs> too, too late. We went in a different it's direction. Here, put an apple in every dumpster. But it's kind of a critical part of the process, right? You have to have it. In yeah. The, and then you throw it away, but if you if you didn't have it on day one, it, you wouldn't have ended up with the prototypes you ended up I with. I totally get it, yeah. yeah. Let me ask you another little detail <laughs> about that. So that big design document, <laughs> does it have diagrams in it? Are there schematics? Yeah. Are there flow charts? Is, yeah. it, is it a balance of words and images? And do you make those images in like Illustrator or? Yeah, so what happens sometimes is we will like open up Photoshop <laughs> and the artists all go like, no, 
Oh, that's a ladder's <laughs> open for the crowd. Like, um, and Raph is actually the master of using in like PowerPoint. I never even saw it before. But there's a little bar for graphics tools where you can yeah. make lines Ugh. and dots and stuff. He like he will draw an entire scene with those things, and I was like, "What are you doing?" You know? <laughs> but uh, he's quite good at it. But anyway, we will often do something like put down a black circle with some lines coming out of it, and then a wider set of lines saying, this is the peripheral vision, 20% likely to see, 100% likely to see at this distance, whatever. We'll do something like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that gets the spirit of it across, and then the engineers look at it, and they'll be like, this is totally not the right way to do this. Here's a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. And they will devise a better way to do it. Working with us, we'll go back and forth with them, uh, and then we'll prototype it, and we'll go back and forth with them again. But again, if you hadn't had that first, like, mm -hmm. here's kind of a target or here's a spiritual thought, even if you throw it away, this is kind of the intention. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's a weird – It's a, Okay. It, yeah. It, I, I said at the end of uh, – I sent you this list at one point, you know, and I ended up not being able to use that publicly too much. But, like – Oh, yeah. I wanted to – Yeah. There was, there was a list of observations. Maybe you can use that. <laughs> maybe <we'll> revisit that. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of them on the list was I think – Really good video game teams, like, okay, so there are models of video game development where you make a game alone, and it's very personal, and you don't have a budget, you don't have a team, you don't have a, uh, a timeline. I don't work in that space. Uh, it must be fascinating. Maybe someday I will. I don't know. Uh, but I work in a space with, a, like, a big team, right? Like, I guess at times our team was me and Raph, and then it was, like, five other guys, and then for a while it was 20 guys, and then it was, like, at some point, 90 people, you know, um, not to go into specific numbers, but it was something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, what was I going to say? Um, Process, PowerPoint, documents, <laughs> di diagrams. Um, the thing on that list. Yeah, one of the points on that one list. Of the points. Oh, uh, highly functional teams, <clears throat> I think, look very bad outside the team. Often, hmm. like I think a team that works really well together looks like a contradiction in terms. Like sometimes our team would like come together around an idea that had been top down created, and then would fight about it in a seemingly dysfunctional way, and then would throw the a that idea away, but but then end up at some point that started from that point, and then like fight again, and then like throw a fit and then like put it in the game, you know, and, and then the end, and then in the end there's this final thing, right? And from the outside, it, you would be like, oh my God, that's so inefficient. Why didn't you just do that at the end? You know, why didn't you do that last step or whatever? And it's like, man, you just, you had to go through that. So sometimes they look autocratic and then sometimes they look overly <coughs> democratic mm -hmm. and sometimes they look painful in their arguments and like you're throwing a lot of work away. Mm -hmm. But uh, But it is honestly, I mean, I can tell you, Deus Ex and Dishonored were both made that way, you know. Yeah. So it, it's 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 hard to get your head around what a good team should look like. If it if it looks good on paper, if it looks good from outside the company, it might not be the creative fire that makes the thing that you wanted to make. Mm -hmm. you know, so. well, let me ask you a little bit more about that because I'm gonna. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I have a very conflicted relationship with AAA, mm -hmm. which I see, and some sometimes I just think is at the end of its era. Um, the idea of a uh, really large scale, really big budget, yeah. um, uh, really kind of am ambitious style video game where there's story and systems and they're trying to be merged together and it's just elaborate and there's all this. To me, it just seemed like that, that you know, we were in the era of mammals and that was kind of a dinosaur. And I'll be honest with you, I playing Dishonored was one of the first times in a long time <laughs> recently where I felt uh, like, a, okay, this is clearly a AAA game and yet there's something happening here that is innovative, interesting, uh, that feels like it could be a path forward and not just the kind of end of, of an era. Um, and um, I guess my, my question is just like, what are your thoughts? Like you've, okay, you kind of spoke to it a little bit, like that is, you feel comfortable when you've just made this masterpiece. So of course, like you're now feeling great about working in that context. Um, but are there, like, what are your thoughts um, about scale, like, is this stuff going to continue to just get bigger, or have we, you know, per personally, you've worked smaller and you've worked bigger, and yeah. and what do you th what do you think about um, 
AAA going going forward? Is it still a viable kind of genre? Can I think of it as like a stylistic genre unto itself in a way? Yeah, I don't know if I'm the, the best person to answer that because uh, I just moved from Austin to Lyon. I'm going to be living in Lyon for a while, France. And a lot of my friends in Austin, it's a very rich environment for indie games. Wago Stranceros is there, which is a, a group of uh, indie game developer community that meets. Uh, and some very good friends are part of that. And so friends, you know, have made Spider or uh, Waking Mars or God of Blades or, you know, Cannonballs and games like that have, have come out of that, the group of people that make up that group. Um, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about or talking to those people. I also keep my eye on the super exciting personal games mm -hmm. that people are making sure. about their, um, you know, their personal life struggles are, are, are fascinating to me. You mentioned earlier my book, Big Jack is Dead, yep. like that's derived from personal experience. So I, I definitely believe there's a place for that. At the same time, I want to see another Far Cry 2. Mm -hmm. uh, I really liked Skyrim. I, I liked Fallout 3, um, but I liked FTL. And, and so it's very hard for me to see those as discrete categories. Uh, I mean, first of all, like I hope this doesn't sound negative, but <coughs> oh man, I don't, I don't know if it's being jaded or if it's doing things for too long or what, but like some huge percentage of games just bore me to tears. Mm -hmm. They don't feel alive. You mm -hmm. know, when I imagine a game, even I think about an Xbox game like Viva Pinata. I loved Viva Pinata. And Viva Pinata felt alive to me in a way because there's this little bed and uh, uh, an environment and there are systems and I can change things and I can go in different directions. And one day I was playing and a crate showed up and it was a note from Fern Hawking and it had these bizarre ducks in it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I opened the crate and they all came out and I was like, wow, Clint gave me a gift. And you know, it, it's like he, he raised something that I haven't been able to raise yet. You know, he created these creatures that I wasn't able to create. Um, and so I gifted a friend who was newer to the game than me. And it's like, that game felt alive, like because it was systems in an environment with interactions and chain reactions and a novel setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, it, it was like that, that year, that was in the 10% of games that I liked, right? Last year, FTL was in that 10% of game. But like, honestly, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about movie tie-in or AAA or indie or whatever category you want to apply to it. Maybe it's just being jaded, but most games are just not exciting to me personally. Mm -hmm. That is not to disparage the people making them or whatever, because sure. I know how hard it is. Um, uh, it's just maybe I've done it too much or something. And so I have this weird excitement for when a game comes out that I actually care about, like Osmos is a great mm -hmm. example. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you was, did you play Germs? I did play Germs. Yeah. I Yeah, yeah, it it's like it's a really nice guy too. It's a liquid uh, physics kind of version of it might have been inspired by Osmos, but it but it but it's liquid dynamics and it's the same kind of concept in a way, but it feels so different and it inspired. I talk about game mechanics inspiring emotions that you can't really have from some, you know, how do, how else do you produce these emotions? Germs inspire, or yeah, germs inspired all of these emotions in me about consuming and being consumed and being larger, or being smaller. Like, it is a freaky game. It made me want to write, like, I started writing a Cthulhu short story based, <laughs> on, uh, based on based on that the ex the mood that I had. I couldn't I couldn't articulate the mood quite, but anyway, games like that come along, and I remember like why yeah. I'm in love with games. Yeah. Um, and it's sometimes it's a board game, you know. And when the Lord of the Rings game came out, that was completely co-op. Mm. Played that briefly. When Settlers mm -hmm. of Catan came out a decade ago, or whenever mm -hmm. it was, played mm -hmm. that, you know. But it's like, it's not every game. I'm not the guy that plays every game and loves it. I I am so sad about the fact that I can't just go into the store and pick up a game. Where I can go into the store and pick up a movie, like, um, oh, what's that movie called? I'm thinking, uh, right, right, whatever. There, there, you know. I watched a, a Bizarro. Irish IRA movie the other night that with Clive Owen in it that I had never even heard of and it was weird at the end but it was pretty good. Mm. 
You know, it's like I can pretty much go to iTunes and find, but I can't do that with games. I don't know if it's just the number being made or mm -hmm. if it's that we're not hitting a high enough bar uh, or if we're rehashing the same subject matter or mechanics over and over. I don't know what it is. Um, but it's hard for me to see it in this category or that category. This one's a dinosaur or that one's a dinosaur because uh, in a given year, I'll play something like Skyrim like endlessly and I'll play FTL over and over and over and I'll ignore 90% of the yep. commercial or indie games made because I'll try them and they just don't turn me on.